I'm in the Malaysian rainforest to find one of the most important, complex, and formidable insect societies in the world. The giant Malaysian honeybee. Each one of them is armed with a potent sting that releases a chemical telling the rest of them to attack en masse. But just getting to where they live is going to be the most dangerous part up there. I'm Dominic Monaghan. All my life, I've been driven by two strong passions, acting and wild creatures. Since I was a kid, I've dreamt of traveling the planet to get my hands on the rarest, scary, and most dangerous animals out there. And now, I finally have my chance. I'm in Kuala Lumpur, the capital of Malaysia. It's a bustling mix of futuristic buildings and old world charm. But my mission begins here in this market. Terima kasih. Thank you. You're welcome. Honey apples. Oh, yeah, that's yeah. excellent. Terima kasih. I've come here looking for something that's only sold in one shop. This natural honey. Terry McCassie. <laughs> this honey is sold to treat such problems as asthma, sore throats, coughs, colds, diabetes. It's an extremely rare honey because it's made by one specific bee found in the jungles of Malaysia. Here, have a look. This is the giant Malaysian honeybee. To protect their honey, they build their hives high atop the forest canopy. And they come armed with a colossal stinger containing a chemical homing beacon. Get stung by one of these guys, and thousands of bees will attack. Which means that harvesting this honey is an extremely perilous job indeed. And that's exactly what I've come here to do. Thank you. To find them, I'm heading deep into Malaysia's rugged interior. From Kuala Lumpur, I'll take a train a couple of hundred kilometers to Temen Negara National Park. Once there, I'll hop a boat that will carry me into the heart of giant honeybee territory. All right, start the journey. I love the beginning of things. Hours later, the city's far behind me, swallowed up by the endless jungle. Far out! I've never taken a train into the jungle before. And not just the jungle, this is the oldest jungle in the world. This is the beginning of Temen Nagara National Park, and the only place to find the Betek tribe of which there are only 1,500 of them left. My guide for the next part of this trip, Kumar, is one of the better. The next morning, I finally reached the Penang River. Hi. Hi. Kumar. Yes. Hey, I'm Dominic. I'm Dominic, eh? Where I'm met by my guide, Kubang. Oh, this is us? Uh, yeah. He's agreed to lead me deep into the world of the giant honeybee. No one knows more about these bees than the Batek people. For centuries, they've harvested the honey made by these ferocious insects. The honey. Yes, they climb up for the roof. The big tree, the high tree. Yeah? How high was the uh, honey? Uh, 60 meters. High. 60 meters? Yeah, 60 meters high. Same that tree. Yeah? This big high yeah, tree? Yeah, this big high tree. So I've clearly come to the right person, but there's one tiny problem here. I'm absolutely terrified of heights. But before I can even begin to have second thoughts, it seems we've arrived. Ah, uh, this is my village. 
nice view. To get to Kubang's village, we'll make a short trek into the jungle. The Batek people have lived here for hundreds of years, but they're not the only society that calls this jungle home. I wanted to show you guys the size of this ant. And this is a timber ant, right? Yeah. Yeah, it's called a giant timber ant. Giant timber ant, probably a relative of the wood ant. There are thousands of species of ant here, but this guy is likely the biggest. And I was a little trepidatious about picking this guy up. That is an absolutely ginormous ant. But what I wanted to show you was just the variations in sizes of ants, because look right down here. This is an extremely long trail of black ants, and it's so many ants here. Yeah, come back. Ants. Look, snakes all the way down this log, as far as the eye can see. And it looks like these guys are on the move. They go, so they try and make in the nest. Oh, they're yeah, making they a new nest. nest. Yeah, new nest. Do these ants bite or sting? Not. No. Not bite, not sting. Ants work by pheromones, by smells. Right now, the smell that has been created to cause this little walkway is now being affected by my hand. And you can see down here, like, look how it's caused a commotion. These ants now don't really know where to go, and there's a little traffic jam here. You know, I read that the combined weight of ants in the world is the same as the combined weight of every human on planet Earth. Amazing little animal. But I've traveled here to find another type of colony, so it's time to get back to work. Back on the trail, we quickly run into one of the jungle's more prickly personalities. Did you see this? What's the point there? Oh, wow, look. Yeah. It's a porcupine. Wow. This is the South Asian porcupine. Watch out, watch out, watch out. Now, as you can see, when this little guy moves, its quills kind of stand up in the air a little bit. As you can see right now, it's kind of pushing them out, making it seem as big as possible. One of the myths about porcupines is that they can fire those quills when they feel threatened. That's not true. But what they can do when something's coming over to check them out that they're a little scared of is they can jump backwards into that animal and the quills will stick in the animal. And you can imagine a wild animal with essentially a huge knitting needle type weapon inside its body. It's a fantastic defense mechanism. Apart from the spines that a porcupine has, all it really is is a very big, tasty rat. Right now, he doesn't seem quite as freaked out. It's crunching on some sort of root. I like the little noises it makes, though. Oh, yeah. The noise, yeah. Uh, yeah it's very cute. Oh, it's on the Whew. Never had a porcupine go through my legs before. And on that note, let's get moving. Yeah, OK, Don. I bring you, so this is my belly. The Batek are part of Malaysia's original people. And though thousands once lived here, today only a handful of villages remain. But it appears that Kubang's doing his part to ensure the future of his people. So this is my wife. Yeah, so this is my family. Hi. I have 11 child. You have 11 children? Yes, 11 children. Like the bees I've come to find, the Batek are nomadic people. They move through the forest in search of food, building simple shelters when they stop. The floor, they're from the bamboo, cover from the bark of the trees, so they make the roof from the, uh, the leaf, okay, the palm leaf. So how many houses in this village? I uh, share uh, the 20 village, uh, the 20 house. Yeah. About uh, the people and the 59 people. 59 people. Yeah, so eat all together. They don't believe in private property, and they say that they are the caretakers of the jungle, living as a community of equals. 
So you sit here, you make plans. Yeah, they make a plan, yeah. Right, and then all the fish you bring in is for everyone. All the meat yeah. you bring in is for everyone. Yeah. That's yeah. great, man. Almost everything they need comes from this jungle, even their sporting goods. It's a rattan ball, but performs the same function. <laughs> Once again, you find yourself in a community where you can't speak the language. It doesn't matter when you play football, because we all understand the same thing. Sorry. Make a mistake. <laughs> I think we could have played this game for hours, but it's cut short by the arrival of an unexpected guest. One of the villagers had found a baby king cobra in the jungle, and it arrived in this. So I opened this bag up to reveal not a king cobra. This is a type of tree snake. I could tell pretty quickly that it wasn't a cobra. If they're very long and thin like this and they have this prehensile tail, and that reveals itself to be an arboreal snake, a tree-living snake. And I think this is either the striped or elegant bronzeback, non-venomous, and it doesn't really look that much like a cobra. The very fact these guys thought it was a baby cobra says a lot about snakes in this part of the world. I'm sure that they teach their children to just stay away from snakes regardless. Don't even take the chance that it could be something like this, a non-venomous, non-threatening snake, because if you get it wrong, it will kill you. This fantastic looking fish, which is great. As the sun sets, I'm invited to share a meal with Kubang's family. Is this fish from the river? Yeah, so this and the, um, the, the afternoon fishing. Mm. Yeah? It's an amazing way to end my second day in Malaysia. So far, it's been fun and games, but tomorrow, it's time to get serious. I'll try to climb almost 30 meters into the jungle canopy and enter the world of the giant honeybee. So I stayed in the Betek village last night with Kumbang's family. And this morning, he and I are off to find the bee tree, which Kumbang says is deep into the jungle. And with as much experience as he has, this could be a very long day for me, indeed. So, Tom, here, so I just stay here. You're taking the root from the trees. Yeah, you're eating you and your wife. So you're like a baby. Oh, it helps you have a baby. Yeah, help for the baby. Yeah, so this and the root. I'm not gonna suddenly get pregnant, am I? Yeah. I am. It's crunchy. Yeah. Quite tasty though. Yeah. It's got some um some moisture in it. But have you have you tried it? Yeah, you try. Yeah. Oh, I feel pregnant already. In in your language, what do you call this? Obed Mako. Ah, Obed Mako. Yeah, the baby. Yeah. Baby maker. <laughs> yeah. Sweet. Very cool, man. The jungle has everything. Yeah. That's great. All right, I'm going to put this down before I have twins. Should we go? Yeah. After showing me a plant that supposedly gives life, he takes me to another that takes it. Oh, OK, Tom. So I show you the poison tree. Poison tree? Yeah. Yeah, the poison tree for the, uh, making a dart for the blow pipe. It's for the, straight on here. Yeah, it's straight on. Let me take off my pet. Antiaris toxicaria is one of the most dangerous trees in the world with a sap that can cause immediate cardiac arrest. So all these all these cuts here, this is all you? Yeah, the sap come outside. So they put this in the trees. Yeah, put it in the trees. Yeah, so like that. OK. So this you put in the bamboo. And it's, it's OK for the tree? Yeah, no problem. 20 years, the chopping. Wow. So do we have enough sap? Yeah. Yeah, you see the inside. And then you dip, yeah? So you put it uh, down, take a little after you hang it in the fire. Three minutes or four minutes, so they uh, dry. So it's same like that, the black color. It goes black. And then it's ready. Yeah, ready. Very light. Great engineering. In the hands of the Batek, the blowpipe is a formidable weapon. 
supplying much of the food for their communal table. That you put inside for the blowpipe. Yeah. yeah. Second, you put in the cotton from the skin from the trees. Mm. You put the mouth. Good shot. Pretty good, pretty good. Nice, man. Can I have a go? Yeah. Yeah? yeah you want to try now? Yeah, I'd love oh. to. I bet he's really good with a pea shearer at school. So, you put the mouth, yeah. the half, right? So you take this from the stomach, so the heart of blow. Thank you. Kind of like a golf grip. Okay, take a brace from Starbucks. Oh, oh! Took a deflection. Can I try one more time? Yes, yeah, sure, okay, no problem. Okay. Yeah. So, how am, do I, am I doing everything okay? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I got it. Yeah. Sweet. Nice, man. Yeah, you're a good teacher. Yeah. Thanks. Showed that tree a thing or two. So if I was in the Cub Scouts, I'd get my uh, little blowpipe patch. Sweet. But we'll need more than a blowpipe to protect us from some of the animals found in this ancient jungle. Temem Nagara Park is home to close to 100 Malaysian tigers, a species that's killed several Batek in recent years. Every minute we spend out here increases our chances of running into one of these predators. So Kuban suggests we take a subterranean shortcut. Cool. Yeah. I like shortcuts. Yeah, you like shortcut, right? I like caves too. Yeah, so this is the cave. Feels like you're going into a different world. This is gonna be fun. ceilings. It might be a shortcut, but the going's not exactly easy. Yeah, so this oh, this guy's it's got the skin of a toad. This real textured kind of look here. Perfect place for frogs to live. There's a lot of moisture, lots of different food. The only thing that this frog probably needs to be a little bit careful of is the odd snake. There's no sign of snakes yet, but deeper into the cave, I realize I'm definitely not alone. Lots and lots of bats in this chamber. Hours later, we reach the bee tree, and I get my first tantalizing glimpse of a giant honeybee colony. So this is the tree that climb up. This tree right here? Wow. Yeah. The first is the small tree, the second the, the big tree. Oh, so you climb this one yeah, first? The, yeah, this one first. How? By rotan, climb the by rotan, not climb up the tree. You climb this small tree? Yeah. With rattan? Yeah, by rotan. And then what happens when you get to the top? The Swedish and the eye throw. You throw the, rattan, the rattan, the rattan to this tree? Yeah. And, and then pull it. back, tie? Yeah, tie it. And then you yeah. take yeah, the, yeah, climb the, the two hand. Yeah? Yeah. And then at the top of that, bees. Yeah, the bees. <laughs> yeah, the honeybee. Wow. This is the traditional way to climb. Yeah. Yeah? Okay, okay. That sounds like a very dangerous job. Yeah. Come on. Climb, traverse, yeah. climb, That's bees. Okay. Yeah, okay, no problem. <laughs> No, that is a problem. <laughs> I'm having serious doubts about this, but Kubong's convinced he can get me up there. Kubong starts by making a rope from rattan, a bamboo-like vegetation that grows everywhere in this jungle. Seems that it's the outside area that he's interested in, the bark. He's actually just stripped all the inside, all the pulpy kind of matter off it. Now left with this very, very strong, stringy bark. So he's barefoot. No gloves. 
just climbing a tree with no handholds or footholds. So it now looks like Kubang will walk this homemade tightrope and then climb another 25 meters to reach the hives. I'll tell you what, though, I am not doing that. It's clear to me now that the traditional Batek honey hunting methods are a little more than I can handle. And if I want to get up close and personal with the giant Malaysian honeybee, I'm gonna need another plan. So after bidding farewell to my guide, I hit the road in search of a safer alternative. Kumbang told me that on the coast, there are some honey hunters that use slightly more modern methods. And my hope is that means their methods are a little bit more safe. I'm heading to Meringue, a town located in another prime honeybee hunting ground. Kubang's told me to look out for honey dealers who will hopefully be able to put me in touch with some hunters. Oh, look, look, see that sign there? Madu Laba, that means honey. These people might be able to point me in the right direction. That was a good spot right there. Whew. Looks like honey, huh? Hello, sir. Hello. Uh, honey. Is this honey? Honey, yes. Pure honey. D is this different types of honey? Different colors is different flowers. Wow, it smells good. This is as good as it gets. Man, I love honey. I eat it a lot back home, and that tastes nothing like the honey that you have back home. It's got a very distinctive, flowery taste to it. So I, can't, I come down here, I travel down here yeah. to look for the giant honeybee. Oh, you want to look to how to take uh, honey? Yeah, maybe we climb a tree, get close to the bees. Is there any way you could help me? I will take you to see uh, my honey hunters group. Oh, now? Yeah? No. Yeah, okay. okay. Yeah. Hanavi has offered to introduce me to some of his fellow honey hunters yeah. who are training in a nearby jungle. I can hear voices up here. Good news for me, these traditional hunters look like they're now practicing more modern climbing methods. The group is led by Professor Madhu Mardan, a honeybee expert who spent years trying to promote safer hunting techniques. I was hoping maybe I could watch you guys work. And... We are going to work on this tree to teach them how to use safety rope. I've actually seen people climbing the trees with rattan. Quite a number of honey hunters every year falling down from trees. And... I guess if they're tied in, Safely enough, the only thing they really have to worry about is the bees. Yes, th that's what we want to do. Join them. Oh, thank you. Meet them. First, they'll use a slingshot to fire a fishing line up into the canopy. Oh, it's a little to the right, huh? Yeah. Oh. Oh. Wow. Good yeah. shot. After the line is looped over a branch, a rope can be hauled up, and it's time to climb. Tomorrow, the team's hunting for the bees' hives, and if I want to accompany them, like I'm told to I have to complete a test. Yeah. Why not? What, go up the tree? Yeah. Uh, sure. OK. <gasps> Even with all this gear, I'm still pretty nervous. Hello. But if I can't conquer my fear of heights, I've come all this way for nothing. I almost didn't have enough room there to get it across my big, wide man chest. <clears throat> Going up. Lingerie, menswear, fear. As close to the tree as possible. Yes, yes. Okay. okay, this is about it. Here goes nothing. Going up. One, two, three. Well, already, because of my fear of heights, I feel like I'm actually climbing the tree. <laughs> That's 
not the case. What I really need to do is relax. One, two, three. But I can't relax. A few terrifying minutes later, I reach the top of the climb. OK, that's good. I definitely feel high enough to have had a bit of an experience of what these guys do. It's just insane. Absolutely insane. So you are an A student now. That wasn't the most amount of fun I've ever had. Well, you passed the test. Oh, really? So, meaning to say that you can join us for honey hunting tomorrow. I may have passed, but I'm not sure I could have gone any higher. And to reach the hives, I'll have to climb three times that height tomorrow. But for now, I'm given a reprieve, and I've been invited to join the group for their traditional pre-hunt feast. Dinner with honey hunters. I can do that. Thank you very much. Malaysians are known for having some of the best cuisine in the world. That's the best. Squids cooked in honey. Perfect play right there. The talk quickly turns to tomorrow's climb, and it appears we're not the only hunters interested in Malaysian honey. Dominic, this is Hanafi. At one time, he got attacked by a honey bear. By a honey bear? Yes. How big was the bear? Not in this face. It's tall. The Malaysian honey bear may be small, but it's got strong jaws, razor-sharp claws, and a fierce reputation. Are there many bears in the jungle? It's quite common down, down here. With so many trying to get their paws on the honey, the bees don't take kindly to intruders, and it's not uncommon for hunters to be stung hundreds of times. <laughs> Does he have any advice for someone who's scared of heights? He said, if you're scared, don't, don't come along with that. <laughs> you could be in trouble here, then. I'm not scared of bees. I really like bees. I really like all animals. You're scared of heights. I'm yeah. scared of heights. I've come a long way to see the giant honeybee up close and personal. And tomorrow, I'll get my chance when I try to make the biggest climb of my life. Back in the forest, our first task is to find the bees' arboreal hives. OK. This is where we go on foot. Now, the professor is ahead of us, up in those high trees, I think, looking for bees. And I'm going to follow the honey hunters and see, thank you, if we have any luck. Hi. Hi. How you guys doing? Yeah. Good to see you. Yeah. You guys ready? Yeah. Oh, they have quite a lot of equipment. The honeybees tend to return to the same area every year, but not always the same tree. So to cover more ground, we decide to split up. It's much hotter. Out here, you don't have the canopy. Whew. Man, but it's very humid. It's... Oh, listen, 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 listen. Oh. <laughs> Fast little devil. Look at this little guy. This is the absolutely stunning clouded monitor. They're also known as the Bengal monitor lizard. And this is a very fat, very healthy looking, not quite fully grown monitor lizard, is that it has this very pale underside to its body. These guys are excellent climbers and excellent swimmers. Now, these guys come with a set of formidable weaponry. If you have a look, these monitor lizards have very, very ow, sharp ow claws that they use to try and break skin, which is definitely trying to use against me right now. Ouch. Woo, these guys are strong. There are a lot of lizards out there that when they feel threatened, they'll actually detach their tail. The monitor lizard can't do that. The reason why the monitor lizard can't let go of its tail is it's a very valuable piece of weaponry. And at the top is a serrated band, very, very sharp scales. That, again, will break the skin. Its mouth 
is very, very sharp. This is a lizard that you definitely don't want to get bitten by. Not only do they have a very strong bite, but when they grasp hold of you, they don't let go easily, and then they eviscerate, they shake backwards and forwards, and that will open up the flesh. And inside its mouth, there is just a whole community of bacteria. So if it were to bite you and open up a wound, all that bacteria would go inside your bloodstream, and make you very sick for a few days. Monitor lizards have forked tongues, and they use those forked tongues to smell what's going on in their environment. Stick out their forked tongue, and if there's a prey animal closer to the left-hand side of the fork, then the monitor lizard will move to their left. And I think I've annoyed this guy enough, so I'm just gonna put it down and, and let it go. All right, you free? Whoa, <sighs> fast little thing. Cool. My encounter with the monitor seems to have come with a price. My honey hunters have disappeared without a trace. Huh. I think I've seen that tree before. What do you reckon, Frank? Do you recognize that tree? Uh, I don't know. I've been following you. <laughs> You know, I've been looking up most of the time because I'm looking for bees high in the trees. So when you spend most of your time doing this and not looking at the ground, you very quickly lose your bearings. I reckon we keep going straight, Frank, and we'll see how we do. There's no sign of my new friends, but I've found evidence that some other hunters are about. Oh, look, look, look. These very significant markings are bears. Honey bear, sun bear. Now, they make these markings for a couple of different reasons. One of them is just to keep their claws honed. But probably a more significant reason is to mark territory, to send messages to other bears. Those messages might be, I'm a female, I'm in heat, or I'm a male, and this is my territory, telling other males to stay clear. What it communicates to me is that there are quite a few bears in this area. While the honey hunters continue to elude me, I've just stumbled across some other more nefarious bee hunting locals. Just back up a second, there's a... Right there. See that little wasp's nest right there, just on the floor? You'll see something fly out. See that thing fly out? This is one of the most feared animals in the jungle. It's called the Lesser Banded Hornet. This a stunning looking wasp, pure black, with this really vibrant orange stripe. These wasps prey on the giant honeybee, and they'll raid the honeybee's brood, the honeybee's larva. The honeybees will protect their babies with their life, but they can only sting once. The wasps can sting repeatedly, and a sting from this wasp would definitely kill a honeybee. The good news is that if these wasps have made their home here, it means that there must be giant honeybees relatively close by. These wasps are extremely protective of their hive, and the sting is supposed to be incredibly painful and I'm moving a little carefully because they're aggressive and they're very, very sensitive to things like noise, vibration, and smell. Because here comes a wasp, here comes a wasp, a little scout. Hey, what's up, dude? Hey, what's up? What's up? Whew. Just back up a second, there's a few wasps coming out. These wasps are getting a little excited. There's a few more wasps outside the hive, and they're just flying a little bit more directly towards me. So I'm gonna pick up my pack and get out of here before this scene turns into a nightmare. The lesser banded hornet. Very cool little wasp.
drawn by the smoke of their campfires, I finally catch up with the honey hunters. But now I'm faced with a new problem. My hope is that this storm is just passing through, because if it's still raining tomorrow, and I'm lucky enough to find bees, not only would it be too dangerous to rig up any kind of climbing apparatus, but when it rains, bees can't forage, they can't feed, and they get very protective over their hive, and they get quite aggressive. So if this storm doesn't end soon, my dream of getting a bee's eye view of a giant honeybee colony is all but over. The next morning, we're back in business, and deeper into the forest, the professor and I soon discover a sign that the bees are definitely close. Oh, look, 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 look. Look at that bird right there. Wow, what a beautiful animal. How close can we get? Are we okay? Okay. Let's see. Let's get a little bit closer. What is that? Honey buzz. Oh, that's a honey buzz. Yeah. Alongside hummingbirds, birds of prey are my favorite birds. They're just so majestic, so regal looking. The oriental honey buzzard is called a specialist feeder because it eats only the larvae of bees and wasps. It's a right chance for us to be able to see this. Oh yeah? Yeah. So why do you think it's sat so low? Why are we able to get so close to this bird? Chances are there could be a giant honeybees around. Oh, really? Yeah. And, and what, it's possibly s spotted them and it's just waiting? Usually when they found a nest, they will perch somewhere in readiness looking for attack. Humans have to be very careful around the honey buzzard because its unique diet demands a truly unique style of hunting. Essentially, the honey buzzard will observe a giant honeybee's nest and then wait for a larger animal to walk by, and then it will fly towards the honeybee's nest, bang into it, drop all the honeybees down onto the floor, and then the honey buzzard will fly towards that larger animal in the hope that the honeybees will swarm all over that animal, the honey buzzard will double back around and raid the brood whilst the honeybees are busy stinging that larger animal. Very, very smart, sophisticated behavior. I remember there was this one time I was with my graduate student. There is four, three, four nests about 10 feet from the ground. So we were wondering what's, what the hell is going on here? And suddenly a honey buzzard flew past our head, dive and boom, hit the nest. And both of, the, of us being chased by the bees. Did you get stung? Yes, indeed. Scores of them. Yes. I got, we both of us got stung, in, but we got a win. Yeah. All over your back, more than anything? All over the back. And in the, the, my head too, and we ran into our, our van, and when we drove away a little bit, then the honey buzzard came and just start predating on the brood. But as a professor studying the giant honeybee, it must have been just fascinating for you to observe that behavior. Yes, you never thought they are that intelligent to make a professor look stupid. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. All in the name of science, right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> if this bird of prey is here, and there's giant honeybees here, and possibly it's thinking about using us as a decoy. So we need to be quite careful. <laughs> we have both good potentials to become the victim. <laughs> <laughs> well, should we see if we can uh, leave and not have a bunch of honeybees come down well, on us? We have to walk quietly. Okay. <laughs> we have to put a You first. Fly, little honey buzzard. <laughs> Further down the trail, we discover why this buzzard has staked out this particular spot. They found it. And they found the bees. In this tree. The honey hunters have hit the mother load. Towering tree that's home to 15 different honeybee colonies. How many individual bees? Each colony has about 
40 or 50,000 bees and for about 15, 16 colonies easily can get about three quarter of a million bees. My plan is to harvest some of these bees' legendary honey, but the professor tells me that with so many colonies in one location, I need to be prepared for the worst. When you see ripples and then a string of bees just dangling like that, those are signs that they are in readiness to attack any time. Mm. Three quarters of a million bees can easily kill you. You know, everybody has phobias. Lots of people are scared of bees. I have absolutely no problem in surrounding myself with tens of thousands of bees. But that height, how far up is that? It's about 30 meters or 100 feet, something like that. It's a real problem. It's completely out of my comfort zone. I just don't know how I'm going to feel once I get past kind of 20 feet or so. All right, well, the longer we leave it, the more it's going to play on my mind. So should we get going? Definitely. While the hunters sort the gear, I get into my bee suit and try to psych myself up for a 30-meter ascent into the forest canopy and a face-to-face -face meeting with three quarters of a million giant honeybees. What's going to happen now is it's kind of my ultimate fear. I am pretty, pretty scared of heights. I, I stop making sense and I get very, very tense and I can't move my body. And it's difficult for me to swallow correctly. My legs are kind of jelly. I'm sweating a lot. My voice is a little kind of all over the place. This is ground zero. Here we go. In light of the height involved, I'll consider just getting up to the bees a victory. Gloves. And to make the ascent as safe as possible, we brought in a lot more gear. But I'm not sure it's going to make much difference. After all, yesterday I could barely handle a 10-meter training climb. What these guys do is just insane. Absolutely insane. And today's ascent is at least three times that. It's up. I'm sweating. Just try and relax. The thing that's helping me right now is the fact that I'm not looking down, and that's helping me think that maybe I'm 60, 70 feet up instead of 100 feet up. My forearms are on fire. first real glimpse of the bees. Surprisingly, my anxiety over the climb is soon replaced with a completely different set of emotions. What an honor to be up this high and to see these bees flying all around. I'm about six to eight feet away from the closest colony. If I was another two, maybe three feet, these bees would get tweaked. When the bees sting, they set off a pheromone. What it communicates is attack, attack en masse. So what you would then get is something between 25,000, 35, maybe even 50,000 bees completely engulfing you and stinging you. If another colony were to smell that pheromone, you could cause a chain reaction of 15 colonies of bees. That's a million bees. I highly doubt you would walk away from that type of scenario. They have good reason to be so protective. Hidden beneath this blanket of bees is a honeycomb containing all their young and as much as 25 kilograms of honey. And they've developed some interesting techniques to keep it safe. What's interesting about these giant Malaysian bees 
is that they have open hives. They create little spaces, little holes in between their bodies and then certain bees will flap their wings rapidly and that will cool down the interior of a hive. When it rains, they interlock their wings and the rain simply drips off the bottom of their hive. When these bees feel threatened, they have a defensive mechanism and it's a shimmer. You can see it there, you can see just this gentle shimmering, this, this movement of the bees. Scientists believe it's a type of optical illusion used to confuse predators. I would class this in probably one of the top five experiences in my life. And whether you like it or Tom, not, it j yeah? There's a honey buzzard up flying above you. You probably should come down now. Yeah, he's flying in circles. Man, that is the worst case scenario. And as the professor predicted, the hive's starting to thin out and the first attackers are taking flight. After some scouts move onto one of our cameras, it's definitely time to get out of here. Down I go. Bomber. Whoa! But maybe they don't have to bring me down quite that fast. Whew. I feel like I've been to Mars. I can't think of a more direct way that I could attack my fear of heights. Now, I didn't get the honey, but I was 150 foot up a tree with one of the most charismatic insects on the planet the giant Malaysian honeybee. Not only that, but I got a chance to see how it affects different communities in Malaysia. This has been a once in a lifetime experience. Fantastic, absolutely fantastic. <laughs>